Professor Alberto Zanier. And a few words of introduction about the lectures. That, that the Minerva lectures have been in existence since 2012, and they've been generously funded by, uh, by the Fernholz Foundation, and we're extremely grateful to the Fernholz Foundation for, for endowing these, these lectures that enable us to bring an eminent mathematician to, to tell us some exciting developments in, in mathematics. And it's, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Xiao Wu Zhang, who will introduce Professor Zhang here. <laughs> Hi, it's my, uh, my really great honor to introduce Uberto. I know Uberto for probably more than 10 years. He's a very uh, special uh, uh, number theorist. So special means that uh, the most number theorists in particular, uh, uh, people doing arithmetic geometry, the Leland program, BSC conjecture, he's working on the very classical type of equations. But he actually, uh, so every time I met him, it always gives me something really surprised. That it's a, it's a, it's a very classic object. So I can, this is some results he has proved, I mean, something. And uh, so together with the Bombieri and the Marston, they really developed today we call the unlikely intersection theory. It is now, I guess, more than 10 years, right? 20 years? Almost 20 years. So now become one of the mainstream in the life and geometry. And he also is a, uh, Kovaja, uh, then he uh, tested the, uh, the voltage conjecture, high dimensional varieties, <coughs> then uh, uh, um, for dimension one we know have the following results. For high dimension, the most results probably come from Zania with Kovaja. By apply uh, this very, uh, the work of uh, Schmidt subspecie theorem. And uh, a few years ago, we know that he applied, maybe 10 years ago, then together with uh, Jonathan Tila, and uh, he, they apply so-called old minimal, old minimal geometry to dynamic problems. We know that this method is, 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 is very successful. It's so successful is almost proof full uh, under order conjecture. And, uh, and, uh, and his work actually appeared in the Bourbaki talk, right? Almost twice in the last few years. So you can see how, uh, how uh, successful this thing is. Okay, so um, uh, today's lecture, uh, he, uh, we better try to give a very elementary talk every day. Today's lecture is, uh, is uh, come from, this is a name, very long name, Games of Steiner and uh, Puzzlage and Algebraic Schemes. So let's welcome uh, Uberto. <laughs> Thank you very much for <clears throat> the generous introduction. And of course, I'm greatly honored to give this outstanding <clears throat> lecture series. And I thank the mathematical department of the University of Princeton, and in particular, uh, Professor Shovu Zhang and Peter Sarnak, for, and all persons involved for offering me this opportunity. <clears throat> and my deep thanks, of course, go to the Fernolds Foundation, which instituted the lectures and uh, provided <clears throat> uh, the general support. So, uh, in this first lecture, so I start by giving uh, uh, the general issue I will be <clears throat> uh, concerned with, and uh, this concerns torsion. Now, torsion, uh, uh, I looked at the etymology and uh, the origin in mathematics. Uh, it refers, for instance, uh, in differential geometry to the, expresses how much a curve twists from the osculator planes. But I will not discuss this uh, viewpoint, but rather the algebraic viewpoint, so, uh, which uh, says the uh, point P in a group is torsion if some power of P is the identity of G for some, 
for some positive integer n. By the way, this origin of the word seems to come from uh, homology groups, uh, which uh, in the simplest examples of homology group which have torsion elements come from twisting and gluing uh, uh, spaces in a twisted way. So uh, this reminds also of the other meaning. So actually, my groups will be all algebraic groups. And uh, over the complex numbers. So I won't deal with the positive characteristic. Let me just give some examples. So when the group is the multiplicative group of complex numbers, which we may also express as the set of complex points of the multiplicative algebraic group, then to say that P is torsion amounts to P being a root of unity. Let me discuss a few examples, the simplest ones. When G is the additive group of C, so now it is the complex values of the additive group, we have no torsion. except the origin. A third example, which will arise also later, it is related to the first, is for instance G, the group of rotations in the plane. This we may write uh, it as a set of matrices of this shape. Now, the real values uh, of this uh, group correspond to, in fact, to rotations. Uh, this group becomes isomorphic to this over the complex numbers. But over the reals, uh, uh, it is not isomorphic to that one. And now, now, torsion means that the angle, of course, each element of the group uh, is associated to an angle. And the torsion means that this angle is a rational multiple of pi. So my fourth example, which will be the main one that I will discuss in the sequel, is provided by elliptic curves. So let me just recall, recall in simple terms the basics of basic definitions here, uh, I give just an example of an elliptic curve. They are all defined by equations of this shape. I choose a special one just for the sake of example. It is important uh, that uh, we have to add a point at infinity. point at infinity in the projective plane. And then we have an elliptic curve. And this elliptic curve, let us uh, draw the real points of this curve, for instance. They look like this. And uh, these curves have a remarkable group low. And it is, this law may be described geometrically as follows. If we have two points on the curve, we draw the line between uh, two. So we have three points, three collinear points on the curve. It is a cubic, so the general line will meet the curve in three points. And uh, the law is such that if we choose the point at infinity as the origin, then the sum in this meaning, in this group law, is uh, the sum of these three points is zero. And it turns also out that the opposite point is just obtaining by reflecting <coughs> on the x-axis. 
So we have a remarkable <coughs> group law, which is algebraic. It may be expressed algebraically, rationally, in terms of coordinates. Uh, this law, by the way, of historical, uh, uh, seems to be, have been observed first by Newton. Although some formulas uh, behind the law were, uh, had been found before. So, so these are uh, the simplest examples of uh, 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 torsion. And now, now the groups I will deal with will be all commutative, as in these cases. And uh, so I will choose an, uh, uh, an additive notation. And the, the main issue in my setting is that now I will look for torsion of a family, simultaneously of a family of points moving algebraically, depending on the parameter. Parameter in a space S which will be always an algebraic variety. And uh, also this, this uh, torsion will hold in a group which again depends on S. And so we have a family of points in a family of groups and everything varies algebraically. And uh, so what we are interested <coughs> is to describe the set of solutions. Now, for a single value of n, this is just amounts to solving some, algebra, some set of algebraic, finite set of algebraic equations. So the problem in this sense is not, uh, does not give rise to particularly uh, geometrically interesting issue, to arithmetic, but but the, the, the thing is that we shall look simultaneously at the distribution of the union of solutions as n, as the integer n varies. So we have for each n, this equation defines, this defines a set Tn. And uh, we are interested in the distribution of the union. Of the TM. This, this set here is called the set of torsion values. So we want to understand the distribution. Of course, there are many questions we, which may be asked, and uh, I will illustrate the questions uh, going on with, with the lectures. Uh, let us make immediately one assumption. Assumption that uh, note that Tn is always different from the whole space. So this means that the point P of S is not so-called not identical torsion for all values of S. So of course, uh, if it is, the, this becomes trivial. This set is the whole, the whole, uh, the whole set. So I will describe now. I will describe uh, uh, bef before giving motivations and uh, results. I will start by illustrating the issues uh, through uh, the so old, old uh, mathematical constructions, uh, which I call games, uh, of two uh, mathematicians, uh, Jakob Steiner and uh, uh, Jean-Victor Poncelet. They were among the founders of projective geometry. And they proposed these constructions around, uh, around this year. So uh, I start with the Steiner construction. So 
the Steiner game works as follows. We take two circles. The player is given two circles, non-intersecting. And, and now the player can choose chooses a, a third circle, which uh, has to be tangent to the first two. So let us call K1 this third circle. And now the game goes, goes on uh, by constructing a sequence of circles. Each circle has to be tangent to the uh, for, to the last obtained one and to the two original circles. So we have now, for instance, here a K2 and so on. You see the construction goes on and the player wins So here we have these circles, K1, K2, and so on. The player wins if the sequence is periodic. For some, so for some distinct values of, of the M and N. So, uh, so this is not, uh, uh, easy to see, uh, the, the, there is a theor the theorem of Steiner. Is that uh, the game does not depend, so the fact that the, the player wins or not, does not depend on the choice of the, of the player. So this is, for me at least, not evident. Uh, it, there is one case when it is uh, clear, is that when the circles are concentric. Then, of course, uh, there is a, every, every choice is symmetric and uh, the uh, it is clear that uh, whatever we, we choose, the, the, this does not depend on the choice. Actually, I don't prove the theorem of Steiner, but it is not, e not difficult. Uh, the idea of Steiner was to reduce to the concentric case by using inversion. The operation of inversion, if we look at the complex plane uh, as uh, the, if you look at the, at the plane as the set of complex number, the inversion with respect to the origin is obtained by sending a complex number to the inverse of the complex conjugate if z is different from zero. And uh, Steiner proved it is not difficult that uh, there is always a choice of the origin which sends the two original circles into two concentric ones. And since this operation preserves tangency and sends the set of lines and circles into itself, uh, the conclusion follows. Anyway, <coughs> so let us assume now to do, a, let us do a calculation with concentric circles. Let us assume the outer one has radius one, the inner one has radius small r, and then uh, easy trigonometry gives that uh, if alpha is this angle, we have this formula. So now the, uh, you see the, the fact that the game ends uh, amounts to the fact that alpha is a rational multiple of pi. So we have, we have the group, we have the situation uh, I was describing uh, with uh, the group SO2. The group is the same one now for all values of R. Now the parameter is the radius. And we have this very simple situation. Uh, if we want to formulate it in terms of uh, uh, roots of unity, we just introduce this point.
And now the group becomes uh, the group of complex numbers, non-zero complex numbers, and the finiteness of the gain amounts to this point being a root of unity. Now, now it is very easy in this situation to see that if we vary the radius, we indeed obtain as many roots of unity of any prescribed order. So uh, this ends the, the, the analysis. But still, already we notice that uh, there are arithmetical restrictions. Arithmetical restrictions if we want that this uh, is a root of unity. For instance, if uh, we prescribe that uh, the radius is rational, uh, then the only possible values are 0 and 1. So uh, by adding some extra condition, the problem becomes more, uh, more, a bit more difficult. And uh, starting from these examples, we obtain also, we may look at double gains. Namely, we play with two players simultaneously. And now, for instance, uh, we may choose circles. So the, the pair, pair of circles of radius 1 and r, concentric, like in this case. And then the pair of circles of uh, radius r naught and r. Now, r naught is fixed. We think it as, as fixed, and we vary r. And we ask if the, there are uh, uh, choices of R for which both games are finite. This is a situation which is more subtle than the former. And uh, now the group is simply the product of the former group with itself. And if we eliminate if we eliminate R from the equation that we, that we obtain, we obtain the, the problem is transformed into the following. We are given R naught. We have this expression. Now, alpha and beta are two angles, and we want to find the values of alpha and beta, which are simultaneously rational multiples of pi, and satisfy the equation. And now, now one may prove there is a finiteness. Finiteness for given, for given R naught different from 0 and 1, there are only only finitely many choices. Of alpha and beta both in multiples, rational multiples of pi. So this is a very elementary to treat, but it is already more subtle than the former game. And let me say that this kind of, of issue goes back to long ago. Gordon apparently was one of the first to study this. He studied this in connection with finite, finite subgroups in PGL2. He was led, in studying this, he was led to equations of the same shape. And then the question was taken again by Lang in the 60s, then by Conway Jones and others. And until re recently, it has been used, a situation somewhat similar to this has been used in a paper of Burgen, Gambert, and Sarnak. And this time, to classify the finite orbits of the Markov, the so-called Markov group. So this shows already this very special 
setting uh, uh, carries some connections. So let me go to the Poncelle. Now, in the Poncelle, uh, I will illustrate the Poncelle uh, game through the elliptical billiard. So we have an ellipse, let us call it B, and uh, we pick a point inside uh, the ellipse or also on the border, and uh, we play a billiard game, of course, by, so we choose the point, let us call it Q naught, we choose a direction, and uh, now the ball will uh, uh, go ahead by obeying to the reflection, uh, usual reflection law that is forming equal angles with the tangent at each uh, stage. So the drawing here is not uh, well done. Anyway, so now, now, now the game, uh, now the game uh, ends. The game ends when the trajectory is periodic. Now, how can we deal with this? First, first, first uh, we observe the following. It is not entirely obvious that once we uh, choose a direction and a point, there is a confocal conic called the caustic, let us call it C, such that it has the property that all, all uh, the whole trajectories of the billiard continues to be tangent to this caustic. So it is not, not uh, so evident. And uh, so this is a first important observation to study this, this billiard. And uh, you see when the trajectory is periodic, we obtain <coughs> a polygon which is inscribed to B and circumscribed to C when the caustic is given. So the theorem of Poncelet says that the game once the caustic is given, the game does not depend on the choice of the point. So once we choose the point, we have two possibilities for the tangent, but uh, so this is again, at least to me, not, not evident. Uh, Poncelet proved the theorem in a complicated way and uh, the proof, I won't give a proof, but I will say some, something on the proof it was given later by Jacobi. And uh, it was based, uh, it, it related with, with elliptic curves. So, uh, so anyway, given the theorem of Poncelet, let, let me write some equations. Let me write some equations. I choose the point for simplicity, then once the caustic is given, I can choose the point wherever I want. So let us choose uh, the billiard, uh, the elliptic billiard given by this equation, for instance. This is an ellipse with a uh, focus uh, at minus C and also at plus C. And uh, I put uh, here the point Q naught. So I chose Q naught equal to minus one zero. And then we have a choice for the slope of the first shot. And this gives the caustic. The caustic may be either an ellipse or a hyperbola. In this case, it is always an ellipse. And this is confocal. 
with the choice, and this caustic depends on the slope. So the slope S uh, belongs to the affine line. And uh, so the equations are now these ones. The, the caustic is given by this equation. Where this K is KS, in fact, and is given by this form. OK, now. Now the, the observation uh, is that we look we look at the following at the following uh, thing uh, the set of pairs we define E S as the set of pairs Q T such that Q lies in B and T is tangent to uh, to C S. And passes through the, and contains contains Q. So we have a set of pairs. So now the conics the conics in the plane have a dual conic which is defined. We have the dual conic which is defined as the as the it parameterizes. It is another conic in the plane which parameterizes the tangents. So we may say that the dual conic corresponds to the set of tangents. And so this ES is a set of pairs which is inside the product of the first conic times the dual conic to the caustic. And now both conics, all conics are become isomorphic to P1. They are irreducible conics. And so we may think of this as a subset of P1 times P1. Well, it turns out, I omit the verification, it turns out that this defines then an algebraic curve. In P1, times P1, which is of genus 1. And so it, it becomes elliptic after the choice of an origin on choosing an origin. We may choose, for instance, uh, the initial point as an origin. And now the Jacobi observation was that the billiard map, the billiard map, by billiard map I mean uh, the map which sends a, a given pair, point and tangent to the other pair that we obtain ab after reflection. So for instance, the billiard map sends this point Q and this tangent to this new point Q1 on B and this new tangent to the uh, caustic. So, and Jacobi observed that the billiard map is a translation on, on the elliptic curve ES. So, so let us call P of S this translation. And clearly, so the game will end only when this translation is torsion. on ES. So here we have 
a more advanced situation with respect to the Steiner, in that the group is more difficult to study. <clears throat> and uh, now the group is not constant. It may be shown, I will verify that this family of elliptic curve are non-isomorphic, generally. And uh, we have to study, so the union of the torsion conditions uh, uh, by uh, vary, uh, varying uh, slopes. So, uh, so now it is intuitive and uh, that we have infinitely many torsion conditions. It is intuitive and can be also proved uh, by simple geometry. Uh, for instance, I just sketch uh, this argument. Uh, what we do, we fix to, to show the existence of torsion values, we fix an integer n, positive integer n, and we take inside the billiard, the elliptical uh, billiard b, we take a polygon, an inscribed polygon with n sides and with maximal length, total length. This exists by compactness. And uh, it, uh, so this polygon must be a billiard, obtained by a billiard, because it is easy to see the, by Fermat reflection principle that if uh, the angles uh, formed at a certain stage are not equal, uh, then it is possible to uh, have a larger polygon just by uh, looking uh, uh, where the, the, the line, the relevant line intersects the ellipse. So by maximality principle, we construct these polygons for uh, in all integers n. And, uh, and uh, now by Ponsole theorem, of course, these polygons, we don't know where the vertices are placed, but by, by Ponsole theorem, the, the polygon remains uh, a periodic. If we move the original point, we will have a caustic associated to each such polygon. And if we move the original point back to Q0, by the theorem of Poncelet, we uh, shall obtain another polygon of n sides, which obeys the billiard law. So in this case, it is not intuitive only, but also easy to check that there are infinitely many torsion positions. Note that the point P of S is not identically torsion, and this follows, for instance, from what I just asserted, because for each integer n there, is, there are points with exact order n. I may choose n equal to a, a prime number, and uh, uh, if P had uh, always the same order, we couldn't have orders uh, by varying S, we couldn't have orders, distinct prime numbers. So, to conclude the discussion of Poncelet, uh, I observe that uh, I want to make the same variation as we had here. Here we had a double game. Here we can also play a double game, double billiard, billiard game. For instance, by starting from the same point with slopes, for instance, S, and the second player is forced to choose the uh, slope S plus 1, just to make an instance. And one can ask if two, if both games are torsion, and uh, we have finiteness. Finiteness for the set of S, it may be proved. This is not uh, uh, short to prove for the set of S, such that both, both are finite. 
This follows from uh, joint work uh, with David Masser. So, let me now just say a few words on a generalization of the Poncelé to space given by Griffiths and Harris. They uh, studied uh, in a paper of 1977, they studied the generalization of the Poncelet construction to three space. So I, I don't describe this in any detail, but they considered pairs of quadrics and acted in place of tangent lines, they acted with B-tangent planes. And were interested in the situations when uh, the iteration of this construction would produce a finite polyhedron, uh, which would be uh, inscribed in one quadric and circumscribed to the, the other one. And this again, they found that it led this time uh, to torsion, to torsion in a square of an elliptic curve this time. So again, elliptic curves, but squared. And uh, after normal, they, they were the first to, uh, they were especially interested in the variation, not in a single situation, but it what happens on varying uh, the pairs in all possible ways, so kind of studying the moduli of this problem. And after normalization of one quadric, the parameter space, the parameter space can be taken as P3 or, or an open subset of it. Of it. And they studied the torsion. Now, this was more subtle than, uh, than uh, in the elliptical case. So even to show, to show the existence and density of torsion values was not obvious. Indeed, they proved it. They proved the density of the set of torsion values. Only, only in a certain hypersurface. Of P3. So they, they didn't, they didn't uh, deal with the general case. Uh, if I, if time will allow, I will describe, uh, there is a question asked by Major if in a slightly different context, but again with a, a, a parameter space of dimension three, if all the torsion values lie in a fixed hypersurface. So this made particularly uh, sense in associating to what uh, Griffiths and Harris proved. And it turns out that they are dense in this situation everywhere. But it is not uh, so easy to see by purely geometrical arguments. They used this paper was a nice expositive paper. They wanted to use only uh, old-fashioned geometric by purpose, old-fashioned geometrical arguments similarly to the situation of Poncelet. Okay, so, so let me now state a little bit more formally uh, my general general problem. So in the first place, our groups will be abelian varieties. Which I may describe as a generalization of elliptic curves in higher dimensions. 
Uh, we may define abelian varieties, only complex one, by the way, we'll uh, be interested only in complex uh, varieties. And they are algebraic varieties, which are projective, which is very important to distinguish them by matrix algebraic groups, for instance. So they are projective varieties with a regular uh, group law. And they are a generalization of elliptic curves. For instance, a product, an elliptic curve is an abelian variety and also a product of, of uh, elliptic curves. But uh, there are more general than this. So our situation is that we have a family of these abelian varieties, like in the opening uh, uh, situation that I discussed. So let us indicate the family with this letter A. And uh, we have the map which associates uh, to uh, points on A the parameter to which these points correspond. So S is a parameter space. And the fibers of the map pi are abelian variety. Complex abelian variety. And we wanted that everything is algebraic. The map, the uh, parameter space, and, uh, and we want also that uh, these abelian varieties vary algebraically. And so in particular also that there is an origin This origin, we want that it varies algebraically. And now we have our point, which we may uh, express in standard terminology as a section. So the section goes from in the opposite way, and it is such that the value of the section at a point belongs to the fiber AS. So we have a family of points moving algebraically. And we are interested in the torsion sets. Tn will be the set of S of the parameters such that our point is torsion of order <coughs> N. And uh, then we have the torsion values. Namely, the union of the sets Tn. So we want, again, as before, that the point is not identically torsion. So none of these sets is, is we want, hypothesis. None of these sets Tn is equal to the spaces. So this is the setting. Let me give another example, which will be useful also uh, in the rest of the lectures, which is the Legendre comes the Legendre family. genre family of elliptic curves. So we define LS as the elliptic curve given by this equation plus the point at infinity that I uh, implicitly uh, consider but don't write. And now S lies in our parameter space which is the projective line but when we remove 0, 1 and infinity. So we don't want to have a degeneracy uh, so that the curves that we obtain are really elliptic. So now, for instance, as a choice of, so you see we have a family, L, and the map uh, associates just, uh, L is the union of the LS, as I as said theoretically. Uh, now we, we may choose, for instance, P of S, first choice. The, 
point with uh, x equal s and y equal 0 is certainly on the Legendre curve, but, but it is torsion. This turns out to be identically torsion. So the set T2 is already the whole space in this case. So we disregard such a situation. And let me make another choice. For instance, this one. Now, there is an ambiguity in the sign, but let us forget about this technicality now. And this may be shown to be not identically torsion. So now a, que a question would be is, are there infinitely many complex number s such that the point becomes torsion? Uh, are they dense? Uh, what can we say of their arithmetic? And so on. And let me write explicitly to conclude today's lecture some uh, problems and motivations and other contexts which uh, led uh, uh, me and others to this uh, kind of problem. So a uh, first general motivation for studying this, this problem fits into the general mathematical context of uh, specialization problems. So there are so many mathematics, I may remind of Bertini theorem, that uh, general uh, uh, the, the intersection with the variety with the general hyperplane, if the variety is irreducible and under condition of dimension, the general hyperplane section remains irreducible. So this is a kind of specialization. There is Hilbert irreducibility in arithmetic that is maybe considered an arithmetical version of Bertini, for instance. And there are many others. Uh, this is a specialization issue because we have the point P of S is not identically torsion. And it becomes torsion. becomes torsion for as not a torsion value. So it is a kind of degeneracy. The, the section degenerates. And this gives rise to arithmetical restrictions, arithmetical consequences. For instance, on the, if we work over the algebraic numbers, this, this has uh, arithmetical consequences of the so-called height, height of the point. And this uh, goes back to Silverman and Tate. And other arithmetical consequences are on the degree, degrees of fields of definition. So when the point, when the section degenerates, the value has to be, the, the S node has, has to have a large degree over the ground field. This is part of theorems proved by, for instance, by Masser and Sinu David and others. So another main motivation for me, at least came from uh, the so-called Manin, Manin's theorem of the kernel. I will illustrate this in more detail uh, in, uh, later uh, in the lectures. Uh, so this theorem was proved in 1961. I don't even uh, state the theorem now. It was proved by Manin 
as a tool for proving the Mordell conjecture over function fields. And uh, he introduced in this uh, important paper, he introduced a lot of uh, uh, stuff. For instance, uh, he studied <coughs> Picard Fuchs differential equations. And uh, I think that what came out of this paper was also the uh, so-called, what uh, become known as the Gauss-Mann connection, which was studied later by Grothendieck, Katz, and others. And, but a crucial, a crucial point uh, in, his, uh, in his paper <clears throat> was just strictly related to the torsion sections and uh, uh, implicitly the torsion values for such sections. So I will state uh, the theorem, uh, uh, the part of the theorem that I am, uh, that is relevant in more precision uh, in the next lectures. Let me give other context where this er arose. Kritschever, in uh, 1982, found out uh, a situation very similar to this, actually a special case of this, in the study of <coughs> what he calls the spectral theory of non-stationary Schrodinger operator. And uh, a point in the analysis was just to show the density of torsion values in a situation like that one, for instance, related to the general hyperelliptic family. So when the base uh, is the parameter space for the hyperelliptic curves of a given genus. More recently, more recently, Voisin, this is just uh, were very recent, uh, was faced with uh, the same problem, this time uh, studying uh, the so-called Lagrangian vibrations. And uh, she, she has in mind an application, an application to a conjecture of Beauville on Chow groups. And somewhat surprisingly, to me at least, uh, it turned out that uh, a tool, a, a crucial tool in, his, in her uh, analysis uh, was to prove again the density of torsion values on a base of dimension two this time. So already going from dimension one is uh, easy, but already dimension two uh, requires uh, the analysis become, becomes much more delicate. Let me say another, still another context is in dynamics, algebraic dynamics. And here it is natural because the torsion torsion points are, are the ones which are pre-periodic for the powering maps. So they turn out rather naturally in dynamics and also generalizations of, uh, of, uh, to other functions. And here there is a deep study uh, from work by Shovu Zhang UN, and recently the Marco and Mavraki proved some Galois equidistributions of, uh, uh, of uh, torsion points and also in a special uh, case in a sense, but a general case in the sense for uh, more general maps. And I may also say that the torsion 
has natural connection with the Galois action, and sometimes the Galois action expresses the mono monodromy of the space, so which is purely topological, but uh, is expressed in the Galois action on the torsion points. So this also gives a further link of the context. So for today, I would stop here. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, so she, she studies uh, fibration x over s, where, uh, where s is has dimension 2. And uh, the fibers are hyperkeller manifolds. And uh, it turns out in her context that the fibers are automatically, uh, automatically abelian varieties. Then he has a line bundle. Which becomes topologically trivial on each fiber. And a tool for her application is to study, it is to prove, to prove, to study and prove that the set of values of S such that the restriction of the bundle to uh, peak node of XS is torsion. Uh, that she wants to prove that they are dense in the base. So task, the task, Group density of the S such that the restriction of L to X no XS is torsion in, in, in peak node XS. With the complex, thank you for the for the question for the complex topology. Thank you. Yeah, it is very important to distinguish this. For the risky dance is much easier. By the way, in the periodic case, the density does not hold. Uh, so uh, there is no analog. Uh, density never holds in the in the periodic case. Could you expand on the comment uh, on the relationship theory application to Schrodinger operator? This I must say I don't know. I only know the situation studied by Kritschever. He defines uh, on the hyper, general hyperelliptic family, he takes two sections and the difference of them so he obtains a, a divisor of degree zero on each hyperelliptic curve and then constructs, he constructs a, a differential uh, with poles only at the possible poles only at the two points and all periods real. So in this differential, if we, if, uh, one prescribes that it has a residue I if one normalizes the residue at the two points is unique and the periods of this differential which are real define a foliation on the base. And uh, uh, the leaves that are important in his application correspond to uh, the values where the difference of the two points is torsion on the Jacobians of the curve. So then how he applies this 
uh, I don't know. So in practice, he has, he has a hyperelliptic equation defined by polynomials, say, of degree <coughs> 2g plus 2. And uh, uh, one may think of the case, for instance, where the section, so there are two points at infinity in this curve, if uh, and uh, in, a, in a projective uh, smooth model. And the creature considers the difference of these points and constructs the differential as, as I told. And uh, then uh, his contraction is applied to uh, the problems concerning the Schrodinger operator. And uh, an important issue is to find out when this divisor of degree zero is torsion on the Jacobian of the corresponding curve. Uh, not that I know, but uh, there are generalizations in dynamics which I think they do not lead to algebraic curves. One may use other methods different from Jacobi to produce other billiard tables with uh, a property similar to the theorem of Poncelet. So such that the billiard map is a translation with respect to a suitable coordinate. Thank you very much.